The first half of the 20th century was filled with some of the worst conflicts humanity has ever faced before or since. Not only did the European continent tear itself apart in the fires of the First World War, but the second as well. More human beings than we can comprehend died in these wars. Even after the Second World War ended, there was still a fear that Germany, a country now split into multiple pieces, would somehow come back and mount an attack on Europe again. It was for this reason, on paper, that France and Britain met in Dunkirk in 1947 to make a treaty to establish a military alliance against a possible German attack. Though some claim this was a pretext for a more significant threat, the USSR. This treaty seemed like a rather banal post-war assurance, but it would come to mean much, much more. I'm your host David, and today we are going to look how, at Dunkirk, the French and British made the first movements which would eventually grow and consolidate to become the European Union. This is the Cold War. So this will be part one in a series which will unfold over this channel's run, telling the story of how the institutions which led to the creation of the European Union developed. However you feel about the EU, it's one of the more significant modern state alliances and a major player on the world stage. So that Dunkirk Treaty would be short-lived. The next year, the UK announced via the Foreign Minister Ernest Bevan that they wanted to expand this alliance to include the countries of the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. This alliance became more and more desired by powerful Western European states because of a perceived growing threat of communism to the East. Keep in mind, this was before the mass remobilization of the United States to a Cold War footing, so they thought if the Soviets ever wanted a fight, they'd need to rely on each other. The treaty signed in Brussels morphed this French-British alliance into the Western Union. And no, we don't mean the one you use to wire people money. Please use www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar to wire us money instead. Now, even this alliance would only be a command center for combined Western European military efforts for a few years. A series of treaties signed with a broader international community began to shrink the scope of the Western Union. The next year, NATO was formed, and when the Korean War began, the military control aspect of the alliance moved into NATO's purview. But that wasn't the only European project born in this period, which became part of the infrastructure of the eventual European Union. All of the Western Union countries came together again in 1951. This time, they included the states of Italy and West Germany. In Paris, they discussed a new European project to make a body which would introduce economic and diplomatic stability between the member states in the hope of preventing a future war. They wanted to work together to create a united Europe, maintain peace, establish a common market, revitalize the economy, and take the steps towards unifying Europe in opposition to the threat on the other side of the so-called Iron Curtain. The primary commodities they focused on for rebuilding their post-war states were coal and steel, for which they established a common market. The organization born out of this was called the European Coal and Steel Community, or ECSC for short. Like many at the time, they believed that economic isolation and resource scarcity is what led to the world wars, so a common market was their main project for peace. Especially with the tensions between France and Germany, which they wanted to prevent from breaking out into a war again. If you look at the history of Germany and France in the century or so before World War II, you can understand why this was a concern. In 1952, the Treaty of Paris, which created the ECSC, was ratified by its member states, and the United States recognized it in 1953. The organization had a president who made sure the aims of the ECSC would be carried out in the member states, as well as a shared assembly used to check the presidency's power. That assembly was elected by the member states. Trade between the nations increased and reduced their reliance on the US for critical resources like steel. Sorry, Pittsburgh. Working conditions in mines improved as a result of the ECSC, 
But the biggest credit we give the ECSE was the first real project to push for a supranational body in Europe. This formed the very bedrock of what would form the European Union decades down the line. So this is what you have to thank. Or blame. Now, while this worked for heavy industry, they also tried to organize a European defense force called the European Defense Community, or EDC. This initiative was not ratified by France or Italy, so it effectively died on the vine. Instead of a European army, How's that for an alternate history scenario? The Allies of the Western Union decided to revisit their military agreement. It led to a significant modification of the Brussels Treaty so that it would include West Germany and Italy. Kind of funny for an organization which started on paper as an alliance against possible German attacks, but NATO still exists and the Soviet Union hasn't existed since before many of you watching this were even born, so yeah. It went by the new name of the Western European Union. See where this is going yet? Many of these projects were implemented to create a theoretical United States of Europe. Some in the EU today still hold to that idea that someday Europe might become a single unified state, and some remain resolutely opposed. While the EDC was still a possibility, there was yet another proposition to fold this defense community into the coal and steel community to make the European political community. A more potent, supranational parliament with a president and everything. However, as the EDC began to fall apart, so did this idea. However, the dream wasn't entirely over. Rather than the political integration of Europe, the new focus would be on economic integration. In Rome, Western European leaders met to discuss building a union of customs which would drop or severely reduce customs duties between European states to open a common market. Capital and labor could move freely around the region. Again, another keystone of the European Union built in this crucial decade. And this project had a sibling. In the late 1950s, Western Europe had a significant issue with energy. Coal was insufficient to match power requirements and countries were trying to develop nuclear power plants. Nuclear power is a tough energy to get up and running. It involves fuel which needs special handling, technology which is technically a secret, and a lot of safety regulations to prevent major environmental disasters. Also, nuclear power plants are a colossal pain in the butt to turn off, so often they may overproduce for the needs of their region. To manage all of these systems and resources, the same European community signed a treaty allowing for a controlled market in nuclear energy, as well as support for developing the technology and standardizing safety regulations. This created the European Atomic Energy Community, or EURATOM. So let's zoom back out and cover just how many new intragovernmental organizations had been set up in Europe by the end of the 1950s. First, we had the Western European Union. It had begun in 1947 at Dunkirk as a Franco-British alliance after the war. They then expanded the alliance in 1948 to include the Benelux countries. Then in 1954, they expanded it again to include West Germany and Italy. To grow the Western European economy, the backbones of industry, coal and steel, came under the supervision of a centralized organization, the European Coal and Steel Community. However, the structures in the ECSC came to function a little bit like a European Parliament. Then, in 1958, after a failed attempt to politically unite Europe, the Western European states gathered to build a common market by reducing trade barriers. The organization managing this was the European Economic Community, or EEC. Lastly, as a way to manage the dangers and promises of nuclear energy, the same states agreed to make a Central Atomic Energy Commission, known as the European Atomic Energy Community, or EURATOM. Oh, you know what? That is a lot. And it sets up a complex network of different overlapping treaties and organizations managing connections in Western Europe. Redundancies and a massive increase in bureaucracy on such a fast timeline would make anyone's head spin. And European leaders knew this. 
They knew they had threads and that the future of a united Europe would mean that they'd need to be spun together into a single unit. The ultimate vision of that project would be the famous European Union. But you know what, when we return to this topic in the future, we'll take a look at how the European community also tried to rein in these organizations and provide a more unified organization. We hope you've enjoyed today's topic, and to make sure you don't miss future episodes, please make sure you're subscribed to our channel and have a press the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com. We're also active on Facebook and Instagram at The Cold War TV. If you enjoy our work, consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash the Cold War or through YouTube membership. This is the Cold War channel, and don't forget, the trouble with the Cold War is that it doesn't take too long before it becomes heated. <laughs>